Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Grant Memorial. Today, uh, we continue our walk through the New Testament letter of 1 John as we explore what it looks like to be a community that is set apart for Christ in the world within which we find ourselves. Now, last week, uh, we came across the word remain a number of times in our text. The letter of 1 John uh, has a distinct call to the people of God to remain in Christ and Christ in them. And so we traveled to the gospel of John to let the quintessential remain passage in the scriptures, the parable of the vine and branches in John 15, unpack exactly what it means to remain in Christ or what remaining in Christ looks like. In summary, we found that remaining in Christ involves believing in him, cherishing his word, pursuing relationship with him, placing our hope in him, being refined by him, living for his glory, and being empowered by him. Or perhaps, in short, letting God be God and staying close to him with our eyes set in his direction and our hearts submitted to his. So with that in mind, as a sort of a working definition of what remaining looks like, as well as the mental image that Jesus provides us with of a vine and branches, I invite you to turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to 1 John, starting in chapter 2, verse 28. And uh, what I will say is today you're going to want to leave your Bibles open uh, because we're going to uh, be in it. I mean, as we always are, but we're going to be in it and we're going to read a larger chunk a little bit later on. Uh, so when we're finished, just leave it, leave it open on your laps or on the table beside you and uh, we'll be coming back to it. But we're starting off by reading from chapter 2, verse 28, and we'll read to chapter 3, verse 3. This is what it says. And now, dear children, remain in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, but what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that, that you would teach us, that you would challenge us, that you would change us through it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, before we jump right in, I, I do want to say that, that this really is a continuation of last week's passage, or it's a, a part two of two. And so if you missed last week, I encourage you to go to our website, and to watch last week's service to gain the full perspective, to gain the context for some of what we'll be looking at today. But today's text, as we just read, starts off just as it did last week with the command to remain. Verse 28, and now, dear children, remain in him. Now, I know some of your translations may say continue in him, but it's the exact same word in the Greek. So remain in him. It picks up exactly where we left off last time and continues the thought now, a quick note uh, before we get to, what, uh, to the remaining part. A quick note about the term of endearment at the beginning. Dear children, or little children as the Greek implies, refers to the fact that this was the community of believers that had developed under the leadership of John and the elders of the Johannine community who are writing this text. And so this community is, is made up of those whom these leaders, these authors, discipled. Right? This letter is not uh, written literally to little children, but rather to the numerous disciples or spiritual children of the eldership writing the letter. This is a further appeal in the midst of conflict to the authority that the readers should grant to the words of this text. 
We are not simply your leaders or your teachers, it says. We are not simply championing a belief. We are your spiritual parents, the ones through whom you have received the good news, the ones who have nurtured you from your spiritual birth. Uh, We love you. We would never lead you astray, and you can trust us as you have until now. What they are saying simply is that what we desire for you as parents desire for their children is that you would remain, that you would continue on in Christ, that you would continue to believe, that you would continue to cherish God's word, that you would continue to pursue him, glorify him, trust in him, hope in Christ and in his word, just as we have taught you and you have up until now. Dear children, Disciples, friends, remain in Christ. Now, knowing that those reading this letter would understand what is meant by the words remain in Christ, our passage doesn't make that sort of explanation. It doesn't go on to say that's what remaining is because it assumes that they know what we talked about last week of what remaining is. And so rather, this text answers the why question that typically follows the what. Why remain? What is the motivation or what is the byproduct of remaining? If we pursue God, if we cherish his word, if we align ourselves with him, if we hold on and lean on him, what is the result? Or perhaps better put, what are the blessings we experience if we abide or remain in him? And verse 24 confirms to us that this is the intent of the passage. Look again at what it says. And now, dear children, remain in him so that. So that. The so that indicates that this is a why passage. And so upcoming are the reasons we are to remain. That which we gain by abiding in Christ. And the text starts off by saying that we remain so that we have confidence at his coming. That we have confidence at his coming. That's one of the blessings of remaining in him. Look at verse 28. Dear children, remain in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. This is a significant blessing of being in Christ. We know that this world as we know it will not last forever. We know that we will not live this life forever. The inevitability of life is that it will come to an end. And what the passage says is that those who remain in Christ do not need to be afraid of that inevitability. The scriptures are clear. The day will come when Christ's kingship will be revealed for all to see. Romans 14, 11 says, As it is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. And what John is saying here is that when Christ is revealed as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, when every mind comprehends this truth, there will be some who cower in fear, ashamed before him that they spent their lives serving something else, and there will be some who run towards him as a child runs to their father with confidence because they've known him all along. They've remained in and with Christ throughout their lives. Right? Those who pursue relationship with Christ have the assurance that when that day comes, he will remember and welcome his friends, the ones who have lived their lives attached to him. As Jesus says in John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, He who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. Those who remain in him and his word are assured of eternal life. Not because what we have done but because of what he has done. And so we read again, dear children, remain in him so that when he appears we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Now before we move on to the next one, there's a a second level at which this confidence works. 
Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. When Christ comes, as our text asserts he will, we will see clearly. We will understand. We will know what the point was of the life that we had been given. And we will see to what extent we use the time we had been given for that which is eternal. And on the flip side, how much we wasted. I'm not sure about you, but when I see clearly, I sure hope that I'm not ashamed of how I lived my life in light of who God is and what he had for me. Right? That's a bit of a sobering thought, isn't it? When we see what was really important, how many of us, or maybe more accurately, to what extent will we be ashamed at how we missed the mark? I think this is a healthy thought for us to have as we consider how we are to spend the rest of the days that we've been given. At the end of my days, will I look back and wish that I had lived my life differently? Will I be disappointed in how I spent my days in light of what I now know? And what can I do about that right now? Right? That's not a bad question for us to ask. But before we all get too depressed, or before we all call our bosses and quit our jobs and head out on the mission field, which may be called for, for some of us, by the way, it's important to remember that this verse was about the confidence that comes from abiding. And so what we can take home from this verse, rather than just tough questions, is the encouragement that the extent to which we abide or remain in Christ is directly correlated with how we will see and reflect on the lives that we've lived. Let me say that again. The extent to which we remain in Christ is directly correlated with how we will see and reflect on the lives that we have lived. Right? If I have lived my life under my own power, for my own glory, and my own purposes and plans, disconnected from Christ, I will most certainly be ashamed at the end of my days when all is revealed and I see all that was available to me if I had aligned myself with Christ and given my life to that which would last. But if I submit to him, if I seek his will, his glory, his purposes, if I truly live my life by his power, connected to his mission, guided by the scriptures, I can be confident that mine will have been a life well lived because the one who we will all be looking at in the end will be the same one my life had been pointing to all along. Okay, now moving forward. Another blessing or byproduct of remaining in Christ is that we are called his children. We're called his children. Chapter uh, 3, verse 1 from our text says this, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Uh, picture with me. Uh, the image of a vine and branches again. That which remains attached to the vine has its identity defined as a branch of that particular vine. Right? Remember last week we determined that a disconnected branch isn't even a branch anymore. It's simply a stick. But a stick that is attached to the vine is a branch. And not just any branch. It is the branch of the same kind as the vine. Right? So a grape vine produces grape branches or shoots, just like an apple tree's branches are apple tree branches, not pine or spruce branches. So, so branches, assuming they are still connected, are not separate from the vine. They belong to the vine. They're of the same substance as the vine. And in the same way, those who remain connected to Christ belong to Christ and by extension belong to the Father who Jesus introduces to us as the keeper of the vine or the gardener in John 15. We are his possession and we are called his children, the children of God. And this concept, concept, concept permeates all of scripture, 
right? Galatians 3.26 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 6, 18, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Galatians 4, 6 and 7, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. And John 1.12, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Those who remain, who receive the mercy of Christ, who remain connected to him by believing in him, pursuing relationship with him, are children of God and can live in this truth. And it's important to note that this goes simply beyond a title. This is our identity. As our text this morning says, What great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. That is what we are. This is our primary characteristic. Church, when I look at my identity, I am not primarily a man, a son, a husband, a father, a pastor, stunningly handsome. You get it. No, I'm not defined by the roles that I play. I'm not defined by the choices that I make, the mistakes that I have made, the things that I do, that which I prefer, or what others label me as. If I'm attached to the vine, my primary identity is in my attachment to it. My primary identity then, if I'm in Christ, is as a child of God. That is who I am. And that is one of the incredible blessings of remaining in Christ, that we would be called children of God. Moving along, we pick up in chapter 3, verse 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God. We've established that. But what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So our next blessing or byproduct of remaining is that we are conformed to his likeness. Conformed to his likeness. New Testament professor and commentator Ben Witherington III, isn't that a pretty academic name? Ben Witherington III. Uh, He says this, John 3.2 exhorts the audience to realize that they are works in progress. They are works in progress. They're already God's children, but it does not yet appear what they will be. What it is prepared to say about their final future is, we will be like him. One of the promises that exists for those who abide in Christ is that they are being changed day by day into the likeness of Christ. What an amazing promise. Now, I know that we live in a culture that promotes staying the same, right? We have mantras like, don't ever change. You're perfect the way you are. You do you, right? Which which seem to have an encouraging sentiment about them. But if we're honest with ourselves, would any of us honestly say that there is nothing flawed in our character? No room for improvement? I think it's amazing that God loves us enough not to let us stay the same. He desires better for us. And if we let him, he will transform us from the inside out so that we reflect his nature rather than our own, which, if I'm at least a little bit honest, is completely flawed. Right? I don't know about you, but I don't want to never change. I don't want to stay the same or just do me. Right? I want to not do me because I'm no good. I want to be more loving than I am right now. 
I want to be more patient than I am right now. I want to be more self-controlled, more generous, more gentle, humble, and kind. And the amazing thing about remaining in Christ is that when we truly attach our lives to the life of Christ, when we hope in him, when we're pruned by the gardener, when we allow Christ to power our pursuits, we grow and become more like the one who is empowering us. Listen to 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Romans 8, 29 says, For those he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Church, the gospel is not simply that we would be saved. right? But a key component of the gospel is that we would be changed a number of months ago, when we studied Philippians, we discussed the difference between uh, justification, sanctification, and glorification in the life of the Christian, right? Now, we don't have a lot of time to get into it, but here's a quick Coles notes just to help us remember this distinction. Justification is the moment that one is declared holy, right? That one goes from uh, not justified to justified, where sanctification is the process through which one is made holy, right? And this process begins after justification. And then glorification is the final state of holiness one will experience in the end. Now, the reason I bring this up is that all three of these theological concepts play a significant role in the message of the gospel, but often we focus so much on our justification, this, this declaration that we are saved. Am I saved? Are you saved? Which is essential for sure, but we miss the fact that there's a process of sanctification through which we are being transformed into that which we have been declared to be. A process by which we become like Christ. And with this, we can also miss the final picture that we're moving towards at the end of our days when we will be holy as Christ is holy, that we will be glorified with no more sinful nature. Church, the good news of the gospel is that we are saved, yes, but we are also being changed and that a day is coming, like our text says, that, we, that the transformation will be complete and we shall be like him. As Luke 6.40 promises, everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Well, if we lean into Christ and remain in him, it is him that we will be like. As verse 3 in our passage says, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Church, may we long for the day when we are pure as he is pure. And may we see blessing in the journey as we become conformed to the image of Christ, looking a little bit less like us and a little bit more like him each and every day. Now, that would typically be a great place to stop, right? We remain in Christ so that we have confidence at his coming, we are called his children, and we're conformed to his image. Thanks be to God. Amen, right? But our letter goes on a little bit further as it pertains to the in-between, the now what. What about our lives today as we await that day when as children conformed to the likeness of Christ, we can confidently run into our Father's arms when all is said and done? What about today? What about tomorrow? Well, our letter continues. Speaking to the issue of righteousness, right living as we're being transformed before we are finally transformed for good. Let's read what it says. I hope you left your Bibles open. Let, we're gonna continue on our text and read what it says in chapter three, verses four to nine. It says this. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. In, in him, there is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. 
No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Okay, so verse four and five start off pretty well, right? By reminding us that through Christ, we are justified. We're declared as holy because Jesus came to take away our sin through his death on the cross, right? Very encouraging and affirming of what we read earlier. However, the text seems to take a bit of a turn, doesn't it? And if you were paying attention, the text seemed to get a little bit scary, didn't it? Verse 6, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Verse 7, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Verse 9, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Right? The text explicitly states that those who remain in Christ, those who are called God's children, live lives that are righteous. And those who live sinful lives prove that they're not of God and that they are not attached to the vine. Now, if you're like me, you may be thinking, but I sin, and you'd be right. Right? The Bible makes it explicitly clear. We are all sinful. We will continue to sin until the day we are glorified and are finally pure as Christ is pure. Even our very letter earlier made this statement in chapter 1, verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So the Bible affirms that we do sin and yet what we've read here is that those who sin are not of Christ. So what gives What does this passage mean for me, for all of us who in one way or another struggle with sin? Do I not know God? Am I not a Christian? Does the fact that my life occasionally produces bad fruit mean that I'm not really connected to the vine? Well, for our assurance, the simple answer is no. Being a sinner does not mean that you are of the devil, as our text says. You see, it's important here that we make a distinction between an instance of sin and the practice of sin. You get what I'm saying? All of these verses say, continue to sin. It's essential to note that the word here used for sin is a present tense verb, actually a present continuous verb. It it implies ongoing involvement. So the word that we read in this passage may be more accurately read as, as habitual sin or perpetual sin, sin that continues as verse six and nine actually state, or sin that you stay or abide in rather than abiding in Christ. It's the idea of a lifestyle of sin, not just the occasional instance of sin or sin that you're working to rid yourself of. The best way that I've heard this distinction said is that there's a difference between struggling with sin and snuggling with sin. Yes, there will be t-shirts and mugs available after the service. No, there's a difference between struggling with sin and snuggling up to sin. Right? The reality is that we all sin. We all mess up. We will all have instances where we make mistakes. We are not perfect, and this passage does not expect that of us. But to remain in Christ involves naming our sin and being grieved when we struggle with it. If you struggle with your sin, as in you don't want to do it, and you're participating in a battle against your flesh, seeking to be righteous, even though in weakness you lose this battle on occasion, this passage is not talking about you. As reformer John Calvin says about this passage, the faithful are exposed to sin as long as they live in the world, right? It's inevitable. 
But as far as the kingdom of Christ prevails in them, sin is abolished. In the meantime, they are designated according to the prevailing principle. That is, they are said to be righteous and to live righteously because they sincerely aspire to righteousness. They are said not to sin because they consent not to sin. Though they labor under the infirmary of the flesh, but on the contrary, they struggle with groaning so that they can truly testify with Paul that they do the evil they would rather not. And the text of Paul that Calvin refers to here is Romans seven fifteen to 16, which says, I do not understand what I do. For what I do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I don't want to do, I admit that the law is good. Right? This text is a wonderful model of a Christian struggle with sin. I sin, but I hate when I do it. I sin, but I want to be righteous. I sin, but I trust God to change me so that I do not stay here forever. But on the other hand, if we sin and love it, if we sin and continue to do so, having no problem with it, or justifying our behavior, uh, pursuing or even celebrating it with no struggle, abiding and remaining in sin, we are, as the text says, not born of God because a branch can only be attached to one vine. Friends, we either remain in Christ or we remain in sin. We cannot remain in both. Let me attempt to illustrate this more broadly as we begin to wrap up. The best illustration I can think of is a few years ago when a young rookie named Patrick Laine for the Winnipeg Jets scored a goal on his own net. I'm not sure how many of you remember this, but in a game against the Edmonton Oilers, the Oilers player took a shot, which was saved and kicked out by the Jets goaltender, and the rebound went right to Patrick Laine who instinctively shot the puck directly into his own net. It certainly wasn't Laine's shining moment in a Jets uniform. Now, the reason I bring this up is to provide the context into which we are speaking about sin. Right? The, uh, the entire Bible, this passage included, reminds us that there's a battle going on. There are two sides in this world at odds with one another. Right? This passage in verse 6 to 8 and verse 10 says that the two sides are God and the devil. There's a battle of good and evil. It's real. And there are two sides. We are all in the battle and we all contribute to this fight one way or another. So my sin isn't just about me and that moment, or me and a decision that I make, there's something way bigger going on that I'm a part of. And when we sin, we're fighting against God. We're standing against goodness and what is right. And what this letter is saying is that if you call yourself a Christian, you've put on and are wearing God's jersey in this fight. You're saying that you're on God's Team, But the problem is that it seems that many people who are wearing God's jersey are actually playing for the other team. We're, we're scoring on our own goal. We're working against our own cause. We're contributing to the cause of the other team. Now, there will be times when we mess up. Like playing any sport, there will be times when you hurt your own team. You'll take a bad penalty or give the puck or the ball away to the other team or even accidentally scoring on your own net like Laine. And that's okay. That's life. The occasional mess up is a part of the game, but it becomes a problem when we're choosing to play in the wrong direction. Or if I score on my own net more often, if I make a habit of it, Rather than contributing to my, the betterment of my own team's mission, I play against it. In such a case, the question must be asked, what team am I actually on? If Patrick Laine scored more against the Jets than he did for the Jets, that's a problem. And 1 John says, if your life works against the cause of Christ, if you are living a life that opposes what God is doing in the world, Take the jersey off because you're not, in fact, on God's team. 
You can't be on one team and play for the other. Right? Let me say that again. You cannot be on one team and play for the other. If you truly know God, 1 John says, and want to join with his work in the world, you can't make a habit of playing for the other team. You can't live a lifestyle of sin and think you're on God's team. But the encouragement is this. There's room for mistakes. The question of what team am I on is not a question of perfection. It's a question of direction. Let me say that again. This text is not about perfection. It's about direction. What team am I on? Whose jersey am I wearing? Who is it that I'm fighting for? Will I remain in sin and fight against the cause of Christ and what he's doing in the world? Or will I remain in Christ, attached to him, focused on him, serving alongside him on his mission? You see, we're all wearing a jersey. We all remain. We all abide somewhere. And the encouragement from John and the elders in this letter to their dear children in the faith is to play for the right team to remain in Christ. And if they do, they can be confident at Christ's coming that his team will ultimately win. They can be assured of their identity as God's children, that they will be victorious with him. And they can be, con become conformed to the image of Christ, that they will grow and contribute starting today and finding its fulfillment in eternity. And church, if we remain in Christ, these blessings are ours too. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promises, the blessings of remaining in you. God, I pray that when we are tempted to attach ourselves to other things, that we would be reminded of who you are, that we would be reminded of these blessings, that we would be reminded of the confidence we can have in you. We can be reminded that, that we are your children, Lord, and that we can be reminded that you are in the work of changing us. God, we invite you to change us. We pray that each day we would look more like you and we would move from maybe patterns of sin to instances of sin and that we would struggle and not snuggle up to what we know opposes you and what you're doing in the world. God, we love you and we pray that, that we would be people who remain and that each and every day we would experience that which those who remain experience. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, not yet. <laughs> now as we do on the first Sunday of 